So today, we'll, I think we're going to only be two more lectures. Um, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> and today we'll talk about two things. The first thing being um, what I'll call morphisms of, of topological control systems. And what I mean by this is a way of mapping um, between uh, topological control systems in a natural way. Okay? Um, <clears throat> and we'll see that the naturality uh, uh, embraces the two features of the definition of a tautological control system. Uh, one feature is the uh, uh, emphasis on uh, locally convex topologies for spaces of vector fields. Um, and the other feature is the, uh, uh, the sheaf part of the definition where um, uh, vector fields are defined uh, only on open subsets of the manifold. Okay? So <clears throat> the first part of the definition um, is uh, kind of a natural construction that comes from uh, from just plain old-fashioned sheaf theory, and I'm on, there's a lot of stuff that kind of baggage in the background that goes along with this, um, but I won't say much about it. I'll just sort of give you the definition, and then we'll we'll see how it works. Um, okay, so and we have the usual thing. Um, So we have a, a C new tautological control system a G. So I'm um, just going to remind you what that means um, since we have taken a week off. So this means that uh, uh, the manifold is a CR manifold, uh, where R and nu are related in the appropriate way, and F is a pre sheaf. Of, uh, sets of vector fields, which means that for every open subset U, you have a, a, a subset F of U of uh, vector fields on, on the neighborhood U. <clears throat> okay, so we have a, a C new topological control system. Um, and a CR manifold N. Okay, so. Um, and then I also have um, a mapping um, <clears throat> like this, uh, which goes from M to N. And the idea is, is that I want to trans use the mapping phi uh, to transfer the data of F uh, to N. Okay. And the construction in 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 sheaf theory that you need to do that is what's called a direct image. Is this so it's the pre sheaf? Okay, and I'll denote the pre sheaf. This is the standard notation for this. Uh, phi lower star uh, F. Okay, so this is a pre sheaf of sets of vector fields. So it itself, therefore, it's a topological control system uh, on N. <coughs> just means it's a pre-sheaf on N, and so what I have to do is I have to take an open subset V of N, and I have to tell you what this set of vector fields is, okay? Um, so I take it back. Uh, this is a pre-sheaf of, of vector fields, but it's actually not, um, uh, um, yeah, sorry. It's actually at this point, it's just a pre sheaf of uh, uh, well, it's a set, it's a pre sheaf of vector fields, but the vector fields are on uh, M, so um, it's kind of a weird construction at this point. We're going to relate these things in a more intelligent or a more natural way in just a second, but for now, uh, here's the definition. Um, okay, 
So what it does is to the open subset V of N, uh, it assigns this collection of vector fields on this open subset of M. Okay, it's not clear at this point why that's a useful thing to do, but that's, that's the construction. <clears throat> All right, so, uh, so like I said, this is a natural sheafy kind of construction. Um, and so for example, you can show uh, uh, that if, um, if F is a sheaf, okay, um, then this thing will also be a sheaf and uh, is a sheaf of sets. Okay. All right. So with this construction, you can define what I mean by a morphism of topological control systems. So, okay, so let so we're going to start now with two topological control systems. Uh, they're going to be G um, and uh, H. Okay, so um, F is a pre sheaf of sets of vector fields on M. Uh, and G is a pre-sheaf of sets of vector fields on N. Okay. And these are both going to be C nu TCSs. Okay, so uh, amorphism. From uh, G to H. Okay, so it's two things. And this is standard sheaf type terminology here. Okay. <clears throat> um, all right, so it's a pair, a mapping phi, uh, and then this other thing, phi, uh, phi sharp, and I'll, I'll tell you how that, what that is right now. So phi um, is just like it was over here. It's a mapping from uh, M uh, to N. Okay, and phi sharp. <clears throat> okay, this is a family of mappings defined over uh, uh, open subsets of N. Okay. So I'm going to write these like this. Okay. Alright, so I need to tell you what these, what kinds of things these are. Um, The definition of amorphism uh, uh, preserves two things. It preserves the sheaf structure, and that comes through the direct image construction, which we'll see here in a second. Um, and then it also takes into account the topologies involved. Okay. Um, so the idea is, is that these maps phi sharp are going to map vector fields from one system into vector fields uh, of the other system. Okay. So that has to be done in. Uh, uh, in, in the right way, and here's here's how you do that. Okay, so I have a family of linear mappings, which I'll denote as L sub V. And again, that I have one such linear mapping uh, for every open subset of N, and these are continuous. map G of V okay, into uh, uh, the direct image of F. Like that. Okay, so that's the, these are the these are linear mappings. Oh I'm very sorry, I didn't I didn't mean that. <clears throat> okay, these are going to be linear mappings on the space of all vector fields. The, the, when the, and then they restrict to these guys. Okay, so um, 
these are linear mappings LB from, okay? So it's the set of C new vector fields on B, okay? To uh, the set of C new vector fields on uh, the pre image of B under, under the mapping of B, okay? So the notation is kind of wonky looking here. So this is just some open subset of, uh, of um, M, okay? So this is the tangent bundle of that, and so these are the vector fields on this open subset of M, okay? And now, okay, um, uh, phi sharp V, okay, is equal to, um, L sub V restricted to uh, G um, of V. Okay. And now these ones map into um, F, uh, oh, sorry, the direct image of F. Okay. okay, so in other words, V sharp V, uh, V maps. Okay, um, G of V into um, uh, the direct image over V. Okay, so in other words, what this means is this is a very long, complicated way of saying the following thing. Um, these maps map vector fields um, on V to vector fields on the pre-image of V by phi. Okay, that, that's what these guys are, okay? And this map is such that it is the restriction of uh, a continuous linear map uh, between these two topological spaces, okay? That, that's, that's the essence of that, uh, that construction, all right? Okay, so again, this is, if you're thinking in the normal terms of equivalence of uh, control systems, it's not clear how this reduces to that, but we'll talk about that in a second, okay? <clears throat> So the first thing you need to do is this definition, as it sits right now, um, is too general, okay? Uh, what you would like to do is you would like, so the generality comes from the fact that these mappings, uh, phi sharp, uh, don't necessarily preserve the control theoretic structure of the problem. And so this, the, the, this, this construction right here is very natural in the sense that it, it, it accounts for the, the pre-sheaf structure in the right way and it accounts for the topologies in the right way. What's missing here uh, uh, is that it should be the case that, um, that this, these morphisms preserve trajectories. Okay. And so of the morphisms, okay, um, we want to consider a subclass of morphisms that preserve trajectories. Okay. All right, so, <clears throat> okay, so note that if V is open, okay, um, and if Y is a uh, time varying vector field on V. Okay? So that means that it's uh, um, uh, in uh, here. Oh, sorry, not there. It's time varying vector field. Okay? So that means it's in um, uh, here. Okay? So I have time domain um, and this was the notation I used for the set of locally uh, uh, integrally bounded uh, vector fields on so time domain T taking values in here. Okay. And, um, sorry, locally integrally bounded. Okay, good. It takes me time to remember my own notation. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so um, what I can do now is by this map phi sharp, I can, I can assign a locally integrally bounded vector field on uh, uh, the pre-image of V under phi. Okay. We have, um, then we define phi sharp y. Okay, so 
So this is going to be a locally integrally class C nu bounded vector field on, okay, on there. Okay, and it's defined in the obvious way. Okay, so it's phi uh, sharp y. Okay, so this will be a time varying vector field. Okay, so at time t, I'll write it like that. Like you, you can also put an, an argument t, but it just looks a little tiny bit neater like that. And it has the obvious uh, uh, definition. So in other words, in the obvious way, this mapping um, uh, induces uh, a mapping not just of vector fields, but also of time-varying vector fields. Okay. Right. So then, what I want to do now <clears throat> is I want to um, give an additional property of morphisms like this to say that they preserve trajectories. Here's, here's, here's the definition. Let's see if I can get this right. So let um, G, M, F, and um, H, and G, the C nu TCSs, um, and let uh, B, sharp the amorphism. Okay. So the morphism is what I'll call natural. If, okay. All right, so for every um, <clears throat> v open, okay, and every y locally integrally bounded vector field on v with values in g, okay. <clears throat> All right, so, um, all right, so for every uh, vector field like this, if, okay, um, gamma is an integral curve, for this time-varying vector field, Okay, so this time varying vector field is on the pre image of uh, the open set V under phi. So that's a vector field now on an open subset of M. Okay, so if gamma is an integral curve for that guy, then the um, image of gamma under phi is, also, is an integral curve for this guy. So this is how you say that the morphism max maps integral curves to integral curves. Okay. All right. So now, um, what it's what what you would like to be true, and what is true, is that this restrict this definition of naturality is just about trajectories mapping to trajectories. Okay. Under this class of mappings. Okay. What you would like to be true uh, is, well, I don't know if it's immediately apparent until you think about this for a while, okay? What you would like to have happen is that this restriction about mapping integral curves, mapping trajectories to trajectories, tells you something about the form of these mappings phi sharp, okay? And in fact, maybe what you'd like to be true is that these mappings phi sharp are really just the derivative of phi. And that's, and that's true. 
in the following way. Okay. <clears throat> and again, I'll see if I can say this in the right way. I might have to stumble through it for a second. So I have a morphism of C mu TCSs. Okay, so it's G. Requirement here is going to be about what phi sharp looks like. Okay, okay so let me see if I can get this right. There exists an x in uh, f of, and so this is really, of course, just a direct image. Okay, so this is a vector field on the open set phi inverse of b. Okay, so that's on m. Such that. sharp of y, so what's that going to be? That's going to be a vector field. Um, oh, let me, let me, sorry, uh, let me make sure I get this right. So, okay, so the final, what I get at the end of the day is the um, y of y is X B um, uh, X at X. Okay, and uh, this is true for every X in the preimage of Y. Okay, so what do I need here? I need that X. Um, uh, okay, all right. <clears throat> Such that this is equal to X. First of all, okay. Well, that's I'm saying nothing. I'm sorry. I'm saying this in a, 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 a roundabout way. Okay, and okay, this relation holds. Okay, so y of y is t x v of x of x for every x in um, the inverse y. Okay, so what this really means is that phi sharp. Um, is obtained, uh, phi sharp of, uh, of y has this property, okay? So phi sharp of y relates the vector field, uh, sorry, phi sharp relates the vector field, phi sharp of y to y in that way, okay? So, so can you say that in case you have this natural condition, so basically the standard push forward? Uh, yeah, it's not quite a push forward, but a derivative, yes, exactly. But the standard, because usually... Um, forward, so what it really means is that Y and phi sharp of Y are, are oh, phi related. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. 
But, but let's say if you have two points which map uh, different points which map to the same point, rather five. Yeah, then yeah. This would be a consistent. Uh, yes, of that's right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So that's so this has to be true for every x in the frame. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so that's that's kind of the, uh, the the slicker way to say that is that phi is the condition. Phi sharp is the condition of the maps being phi related. Okay. Which is which is very nice. Um, uh, because it kind of eliminates um, any uh, sort of um, any other stuff that might be going on with phi sharp. Okay. <clears throat> now let me see if I can uh, describe how you would make a. Con and I'm not going to do this in a very precise way. Uh, in a very precise way, I think there's probably a tiny bit of work to be done here. But what I all I really want to try and do is indicate how this formulation looks for kind of ordinary control systems. Okay. All right, so for ordinary control systems, okay, so let's okay, so it's an M and F and a C. So I have two of these guys. So what kind of transformation from sigma 1 to sigma 2 are we talking about um, when we're talking about a natural transformation like this? Okay. I should say a natural morphism. That's the language I'm using. Now have these two pieces of data, you know, states and controls, right? So the whole point of the tautological framework is the control set is gone, okay, and it's being replaced by families of vector fields. So the mapping here, phi sharp, is kind of the mapping from controls in some sense, right? Okay. So how does that look here? <clears throat> okay. So um, the way to think about it is, and again, this is going to there's there's probably a, a theorem here. Okay. So in other words, there's a theorem that will say that. Uh, a natural morphism, so remember that associated with each of these guys, these sigmas, is a tautological control system. Okay, so um, uh, I can probably talk about a morphism from the associated the top tautological control system here to the one here, um, but I haven't actually done this uh, um, um, just because just I haven't done it, but there's probably some very interesting things about continuity and stuff that you have to deal with there. Okay. But any, informally, it looks like this. So you have a mapping, and what this mapping does, it's a strange sort of thing a priori. <clears throat> so it takes states from uh, the first system and controls uh, from the second system and gives you uh, controls from the first system. All right, and probably, so this is where the interesting stuff will happen, probably there has to be some uh, uh, interesting, and it's not just going to be about continuity of these mappings, right? Um, it's going to be continuity of the mapping uh, uh, induced by kappa on spaces of vector fields, okay? And not, not just continuity of that guy, right? So there's probably some conditions on kappa that I haven't worked out, okay? But in any case, um, Okay, so let's see here. So, um, okay, so F2, okay, is the mapping now, remember, from M2 cross C2 into the tangent bundle. Okay, so I'm going to fix the control U2. Okay, so this is now a vector field, all right, um, on uh, uh, M2. Okay, so that's a C nu vector field on M2. Okay. All right, so it's going to be, um, uh, uh, so let's see here. So um, it'll be evaluated at a point uh, x2, let's say. Let's see if I can figure out how this works. Okay, so it's going to be, now this guy, um, 
Oh, actually, sorry. I think what I need here is I don't need U2. I need this control. I need kappa of um, X1 and uh, U2. Uh, no, 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 sorry, 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 yeah, I got it backwards. Um, all right, so it's gonna, it's gonna involve, so F1, here, let me just write all the symbols down, and then there's only gonna be one way they can go together. Okay, so this is gonna be uh, X1, two, okay, and it's F1. So is X1, five, X2 or something? Uh, I don't know, let me just see what happens here. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, this is going to, uh, what I can do, this is gonna be a tangent vector uh, so when I evaluate this thing at x1, I can apply t x1 phi to it, okay, um, and I should get uh, uh, that. I think that's the condition. Yeah. And so x2 would be five or something. Uh, yes, that's right. So uh, um, for um, uh, x2 equals x1. So in other words, that's how uh, you assemble this, that's how the data for normal control systems are related. Um, uh, the what's being related here, um, and this is kind of a, a, something strange, but I think also somehow it's natural. Um, uh, the what you're telling, what you're providing is what the controls for the first system look like, okay, um, as functions of states for the first system and controls for the second system under that relation, okay? <clears throat> All right, so you know, um, so here, you know, phi one is not arbitrary. Phi one is related to phi two, right? So, so well, this looks weird because it's an argument of x one, but it, it's not because it really x one depends on x two. Okay. All right, so that's kind of what a nat the notion of a natural morphism uh, does um, um, for normal control systems. Okay. All right, so finally, or not finally, but next what you want to do is you want to consider equivalence. Right? So an equivalence will be um, uh, an isomorphism in this category. So what's the definition of an isomorphism? <clears throat> okay, so an isomorphism of C nu TCS is G. And H is okay. All right, so is a morphism um, so a morphism is a pair of things. Okay. <clears throat> And it has the obvious properties. So B um, is a CR diffeomorphism. And um, B sharp, B, okay, so B is an open subset of N. Um, okay, so phi sharp, remember, by the definition of a morphism is the restriction of some continuous linear map, which I've denoted L sub V, uh, to G of V, okay. <clears throat> and the requirement here, of course, is that LV should be a nice morphism in the category of locally convex spaces. A linear homeomorphism. <clears throat> okay, so then, of course, what remains um, is to say what a natural isomorphism looks like. Okay, so this won't be surprising. by the notation because natural isomorphism means something in category theory, and that's not what I mean here. Okay, 
I just mean natural in the sense of preserving trajectories. <clears throat> So we, of course, have to have the phi is a, a, a diffeomorphism, and then the condition for um, uh, phi sharp is that it be pushed forward. Okay, so what does that mean exactly? So it means that um, phi sharp phi. Okay. <clears throat> so this is going to. So again, I need to. Um, uh, I need to uh, look at the symbols before I can say exactly what this is. Um, <clears throat> so this is, remember, a mapping from uh, uh, G of V into uh, F of um, the inverse of V. Okay. All right. So, um, E sharp. B. Okay, so now this is going to be applied to, um, oh, uh, oh, right, right, right. So, yes, yes, so uh, the point is, um, um, this mapping just turns out to be um, uh, yeah. Let me let me just I'm I'm I'm, I'm being awkward about this. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I need to look at all my definitions again. Um, so oh right 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 right. I guess good. Okay, sorry. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so this is going to take a vector field. This is now a vector field on V. So this is going to take a vector field Y. Okay, um, and uh, by definition, okay, um, this is going to be a vector field on V inverse of Y. So this will be evaluated at a point X. And yes, so this thing is just um, um, uh, phi uh, star Y. Uh, evaluated at X. Okay, so it's just push pullback actually. What is the other star? Pullback. Just well, ordinary so standard pullback. Yes, pull yes, pull yes, pull yes, pull yes. Okay. Okay? Yeah, so good. So um, uh, so the point is uh, that okay, so um, this in my view is very good news. Okay. Why is this very good news? Um, because what it tells you is that you would, if you pose kind of the natural definition of morphisms for tautological control systems, and again, that means uh, preserving the two structures that you have, the pre sheaf structure and the locally convex structure um, for your families of vector fields, okay? <clears throat> then the equivalence, the natural equivalence in this category, and so natural here, here means trajectory preserving, the natural equivalence of vector field is just you know, basically change of coordinates. Okay, so this just, you know, phi is a diffeomorphism from n to n, um, and you know, so um, uh, vector fields in uh, one system are just related to the other system essentially by you know, changing coordinates by phi. Um, and so uh, if you want to now study equivalence, in uh, this category, this is impossible, okay? Because what are you studying? You're studying equivalence of vector fields under diffeomorphism. Um, that's only something that you can look at in very, very special cases, okay? So there's people who study these, you know, and I shouldn't say vector fields, I should say families of vector fields, okay? So study families of vector fields which are the same under diffe pullback by diffeomorphism. Oh, sure. so yes. This is, global, this, is, this is global, you could make it local. And that's one thing, uh, and the way you would make it local here um, uh, is actually to work with stocks. Yeah, but but I haven't done it. I did, this is one of the very, very first things I did when I did this stuff, and I haven't looked at it in a long time. Um, so all the stuff about stocks, I kind of thought about carefully after I did this, but but that's how you would do that. It would be uh, mappings from stocks to stocks. Yeah. So look like what was saying, you don't see that, you can only look at the values of those of similarities of vector fields, right? I guess if you have non-similar vector fields, then you can always... Um, so I, I prefer to think of that question differently. Um, I prefer to think of that question as it's, it's just not interesting. 
<laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Um, um, in this, in, I mean, it's interesting in the sense that, yes, it's, and remember, these aren't just vector fields, these are families of vector fields, right? So then it becomes more complicated, right? So then, you know, you're really, you know, maybe a, a special uh, version of this would be distributions, right? Um, you know, the vector fields, the families of vector fields are sections of a distribution, right? So then you're talking about, you know, the usual classification of distributions that people talk about, right? And that's hard, right? So the point is, is that this includes two um, things, both of which are generally regarded as untouchable. One is you know, classification of distributions, right? Um, so you can do this in special cases, and there's you know, a big industry out there to, to talk about this, but in any generality, that problem is very hard. And it also includes, of course, as a special case, uh, um, you know, if you're, yeah, exactly, classifying singularities of vector fields, and that's also impossible. Um, and so from that point of view, if you want to you know, view this as providing useful information about equivalence, this does not do that, but it shouldn't do that. Um, um, because this whole, the whole idea of this framework is not to study equivalence, <laughs> um, but to study uh, a, a way of formulating control systems which is independent of control parameterization. And this achieves that because the only um, uh, uh, thing that appears in equivalence is just um, changes of state. Okay? There's nothing to do with control here. It's just changes of state. Okay? And then the mappings on vector fields are induced by, by, by the mapping on states. Uh, it's not very independent of uh, controls because uh, I guess uh, for, for every two control, well, if you have ordinary control systems and uh, well, they, if they have the same trajectories but they don't have the same uh, control sets, it's possible that they're uh, topological. Regardless of anything like that, this theorem is true. Oh, yes. For sure. Yeah, so that's all I'm saying. I'm not saying anything more than just this. I'm saying that in the category of tautological control systems with this definition of equivalence, okay, the control dependence washes away. And the only invariance is determined by the mapping feed. I'm not talking about those. Those are kind of a different thing and I don't know quite how to do those. Okay? Um, and I'm not talking about trajectories. Right? I'm not saying that they're equivalent when they have the same trajectories. I'm not saying that. Right? I'm saying they're equivalent when that's true. Yeah, yeah, that, that's yeah, that's right. right. And so I'm saying that with this natural definition of equivalence, okay, there, there may be other more interesting versions of equivalence, um, but with this definition of equivalence, um, it achieves what I want. Yeah, um, there's lots of other stuff to study here. There's just no question about this. Um, uh, but at least this is saying something, right? This is saying that this formulation um, uh, uh, um, leads you to uh, a notion of equivalence which has this very desirable property of um, washing away uh, mappings between controls. When you, you know, when people study equivalence of control systems, very often there's this notion of feedback equivalence, and you have to, you know, keep track of uh, controls like I did over there. Um, here, you don't have to do that. Sometimes the control dependency is still there, but it's even because that's the, uh, the assumption you're indexing your family of vector fields with the control basis. Yeah, but even that's getting killed by, it's just saying that that's related by push forward or pullback. Yeah. Right, sometimes the indexing family. So, so the one way to think about the difference between, and, and this is, it's kind of a, um, if you think about it this way, um, you know, you have to really squint your eyes to see the difference between the normal formulation and what I've done here. Um, what I've really done <clears throat> is I've removed the index, right? So when you talk about one of these guys, you have an explicit index, u, and you keep track of that u, right? And, and, and then when you talk about trajectories, what do you do? You make u depend on t, and I do something different, right? So it's a subtle difference, okay, in some sense. Right. It's replaced by the membership. Exactly. It's, you're replacing an unindexed family of vector fields. Exactly. Yeah. So you're losing the index. But that seems like a trivial thing. But on the other hand, there's there's kind of something there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because the, and then really, uh, so what it reveals, I think, if you think about it that way, it reveals that a lot of things that people talk about in control theory depend on that index, right? That that process of indexing vector fields. Um, uh, permeates control theory, and you know. So the example that I gave you at the beginning with two equivalent systems, with you know, um, one has a controllable linearization, the other one doesn't. I mean, that's just a factor of the fact that when you define linearization, we're going to talk about linearization next time. Um, when you define linearization in the textbook sense of linearization, the indexing matters. 
but it shouldn't matter. Um, and so you lose the index here, yeah. You know? um, but you pay a price for that. And the price is all the complication that I've just spent um, 11 lectures talking about, okay? All right, <clears throat> good. Um, uh, so, so this suggests that this is an interesting idea, okay? So, so there's a natural notion of, of equivalence that removes dependence on stuff that you would rather things not depend on, which is um, the explicit index of your system um, by controls, okay? All right. <clears throat> So, the last, so I'll, I'll talk today, and so I'll be finished probably a little, a little bit early today, since we've already done a lot of the work here. Um, so remember when we talked about um, sheaves of time-varying vector fields, okay? So, so we talked about that, and at the end of that discussion, the punchline of the discussion at that time was that we had this um, uh, homeomorphism kind of of stocks that characterize the flow of a time-varying vector field, okay? Um, now what I want to do is I want to think about the importance of, um, of that, those kinds of considerations for talking about trajectories. Because uh, the notion of trajectory that I gave before is actually quite restrictive, okay? And the problem is this. Um, when we talked about trajectories before, what did we do? So we have a tautological control system, and we said that a trajectory is an integral curve. For some um, did was we fixed an interval t and we fixed an open subset u okay now this it turns out is not uh, a very good way to define trajectories and the reason as I, I alluded to this when uh, when I talked about these sheaves of time-varying vector fields before. And um, so I, I, I'm not going to give you an explicit example. It's maybe an interesting exercise to, uh, if you want to understand this stuff, to try to come up with such an example yourself. Um, but you can imagine <clears throat> a sheaf of time-varying vector fields um, that kind of, uh, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to draw time here, and I'm going to draw m here. Okay, um, and I have, um, you know, so so basically by choosing a t and a u, I get a um, I get a square, right? Um, so this is let's say a u and a t, um, and so I get a vector field which is kind of defined on there. Okay, um, and so. You know, I can I can talk about an integral curve, and that integral curve, by definition, has to evolve in u. Okay, um, uh, but I could also have a situation where I have, you know, another interval like this, and another time domain like this, um, and so these overlap in a manner like so. Okay, um, and so I could have a trajectory which kind of starts in u. And, and ends in U, but also ends in this other thing, V, and let's call that S, okay? Um, and then uh, my other vector field kicks in and takes me somewhere where I couldn't go uh, by following the original time-varying vector field in U. And you would still like this to be a trajectory of your system because it's a concatenation of two other trajectories, okay? So it's kind of a natural thing. You concatenate these two trajectories. You would want for that to be a trajectory, but um, there may be uh, no vector field which is defined on 
the whole thing here uh, for which this is an integral curve. All right, and that's kind of one of the um, you know attributes. Um, without using the word good or bad, is one of the attributes of the sheaf way of doing things, is that you can have things like this that actually happen. Okay? So you want to be able to talk about trajectories like this um, uh, for, for these systems in a systematic way. <clears throat> you want the trajectories to be sheaf. Yeah, exactly. You want them to patch like, like a sheaf patches. That's right. Okay, so your notion of trajectory should somehow just be local. Uh, um, so it should only really kind of depend on stock. Okay. All right. Um, so so now so as I said, we did a lot of the work before, and um, so remember that I had these uh, families of time-varying vector fields, and I had some notation for these, um, like this. Okay. So this was a uh, sheaf of uh, um, time varying C new vector fields. And of course, the time varying nature was accounted for in just the right way so that the, the topologies all worked. And so, so there was the definition of this. And there was the definition involved, uh, I'm not going to write it down, but I'll remind you. Um, the definition involved saying what this sheaf looks like um, on sets, on, on squares, uh, square subsets of T cross M. So T prime is an open interval in here, and U is an open set in here. And to describe the sheaf, I told you what this thing was on open sets that looked like that. And then I told you that if you define um, a sheaf on a basis for the topology, okay, and this is a basis for the topology on T plus M, uh, uh, that's enough to define the sheaf. Okay? But then what I told you was that there's another way of thinking about that um, about that sheaf of time varying vector fields, and it's like this. <coughs> okay, so the sections of this sheaf. over an open subset W, <coughs> okay, arbitrary open subset W, um, our mappings are, you know, in one-to-one -one correspondence in a natural way with mappings, okay, X, okay, and X were mappings from uh, W into the FLA space of the sheaf of vector fields, so this was, uh, G new TM. Okay. So this is uh, the uh, disjoint union of all the stocks of this sheaf. Okay. And then there was a natural topology on here, which was the FLA topology. And you'll remember how the FLA topology worked. I'll kind of draw a picture of it for you. Okay. So here's uh, M. You take an open subset U of M. Okay. And then at each point in U, uh, you have. So now I also have a vector field defined on U. And at each point x, I take the, the um, germ okay, um, of that vector field. If this is a point in the FLA space, and I do this at every point, um, I take the fixed vector field x, and I take its germ at every point in u. And I, you can think of this as being a, 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 like a graph uh, uh, in the disjoint union of the stocks. The open set, the basis for the open sets here are these guys. Okay, that's the FLA space and, and with its topology. Okay. And so these mappings okay, um, have to have some properties. Okay, so if I fix a T in W, and okay, this mapping, um, Okay, so this is a mapping now from M into here. Okay, so that's continuous with the normal topology on M and the FLA topology here. And this mapping for fixed X is um, uh, um, integrable, <coughs> or I should say 
locally uh, in Drupal. Um, in the stock topology. Okay, so that's a very concrete way of thinking about what um, sections of the sheaf of tie varying rectangles are. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so now, yeah. um, so what you can do now is you can use this thing to very succinctly um, uh, extend notions that we had talked about before. Okay. So we had talked about the notion of an open loop system. Okay. So remember what an open loop system was. An open loop system said you fix a, a U and you fix an open subset of M. Okay, and then you fix uh, an interval t, and then you consider some time-varying vector field, uh, uh, I'm sorry, some subset of time-varying vector fields defined on uh, the time domain t and the open subset m. And the point is that you fix that t and you fix that uh, u, and, that, and, and so you inherit these kinds of problems with that definition of an open loop system. Um, uh, here, because, um, uh, because we're dealing with FLA systems, we don't have that problem, and we can work with arbitrary subsets of, of T cross M. Okay, so an, open, an FLA open loop system um, uh, is a local section over some open subset W of this uh, of this sheet. <coughs> So this means I fix some open subset W of time and state, uh, and I just choose some time varying vector field in this sense. Okay, so that means it's a mapping like this. Okay, so that's an open loop system. Okay, you can also talk about open loop subfamilies. And that's LA open loop subfamily. So, in our previous discussion, what was the idea of an open loop subfamily? An open loop subfamily means that maybe you want to restrict the kinds of vector fields that you're considering. So maybe, <clears throat> rather than talking about locally integrally bounded vector fields, maybe you want to talk about vector fields that are locally essentially bounded. Okay, so this gives you a way of adding additional restrictions onto the kinds of controls that you consider, more or less. Or you can think about uh, uh, um, compact valued vector fields. Okay. You can think about piecewise constant vector fields. Okay. So those were the three kinds of examples uh, of um, open loop subfamilies that we talked about. And you can do the same thing here. So what you do is you assign to each open subset W Some subset. Um, <clears throat> all right, so I'll call it uh, G sub W. Okay, and what's this going to be? This is going to be some subset of um, sections of the sheaf over W. Okay, so for each open set of subset W, I have a subset of these time varying vector fields that I'm going to consider. And I'm uh, <clears throat> sorry. I forgot a piece of notation here. Um, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, um, it has a more or less obvious definition. Um, okay. So this is going to be. <clears throat> The sheaf of time varying vector fields with values in F. Okay, so the only difference here is that 
So these are going to be mappings, instead of being mappings into here, they're going to be mappings into um, uh, the HLA space of F. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so they have to come from our control system is the point. All right. So you choose a subset of these guys. So again, you can think of these as being um, essentially bounded, compact valued, piecewise continuous, any kinds of normal restrictions that you would want to put on controls that you can you can consider this is how you would do it. And you need some some condition on, on these families, G sub W. Okay. Um, and that is if I take a W1, um, which is contained in W2, okay, it has to have the restriction property. Okay. So if you take um, uh, G, all right, so W2, uh, and you restrict to W1, okay. So you take all the vector fields from here, and you restrict them from W2 to W1, and this has to be, of course, in set of vector fields on W1. And this is the normal, again, this is the, you must respect the pre sheaf property of things. Okay, that has, that has to have this restriction property. Okay. <clears throat> and then finally, so there's no, there's no results here. The result, the results here are, are, are is, is that. Okay, so then you can define what a trajectory means. Okay, so, and, trajectory. Okay. All right. So what's this going to be? Okay. So you have to think a tiny, tiny bit about this uh, um, because <clears throat> these are not vector fields, right? These take values in the atel space. So at every point t uh, t comma x in W, you don't get a tangent vector, you get a vector field. But of course, you can evaluate that vector field at x. So you really do have a tangent vector at every point. absolutely continuous curve um, from some, so T prime, so I didn't really quite say so, but I, in this, all, in all of this construction here, I've fixed some time domain T, where I want to consider times as living. T could be all of R, could be the positive numbers, you know, could be some interval, if all one is considered, you know, maybe an optimal control problem to find on some interval, so, but T is an arbitrary interval, T prime is a sub-interval. So, um, okay, so there's going to exist some local section here. Um, For some open subset W, okay. such for which, okay, so C prime of T. Okay, so again, if I evaluate. Um, x at t comma c of t, that's not a tangent vector, that's a germ, but of course germs, I can just take the germ and evaluate it at x c of t, okay? <clears throat> so I can go um, evaluation at x c of t of x of t, c of t, okay? Where, okay, this map, okay? So what it does is it takes the stock, um, <clears throat> So it takes uh, the stock of the sheaf of vector fields. It gives me the tangent vector and has the obvious definition. Okay, so, so that's the sign of fun, right? 
you have your own details, right? It's on the left, it's exciting. Yeah, that's a problem, right? So, uh, so you have your own details. So the question is, <coughs> is continuity in X of that mapping to the germ enough? Or you need For existence? To, yeah. If you These two like conditions that. together, both of them together, not, not, just, not any one of them, okay? These two things together mean that around every point in W, a T and an X, there's some little interval in T, some little neighborhood in M, so that when you restrict X to that product, it's um, L, I, gamma, nu. That, and so that by our existence and uniqueness terms of weight, and also regular dependence, right? So yeah. And what are the Lipschitz as you see them here? Oh, well, I'm, I mean, if, if these things are L, I, gamma, nu for nu larger than lip. Oh, okay. yeah, that's yeah, okay. yeah. So it's right there. Yeah, that's right. I see. Okay. Remember, Excuse me, Lipschitz dependence only gets, sorry, Lipschitz-ness of the vector field only gets you Lipschitz dependence on initial conditions. Uh, and also uniqueness of the trajectory. Oh, of course, of course, of course. But I, I mean, um, though that, that kind of goes without saying. But in terms of regularity, sure. You, yeah, sure. And so, yeah. Okay. so that, that, that's all hidden there. Okay? All right, so this is the notion of, a, 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 of an et al. trajectory. And so, um, <clears throat> Okay, so you can do now. So this notion of anti trajectory is uh, sufficiently um, flexible to allow you to do normal control theoretic type things. So. <clears throat> Um, one can use, and so I'm not going to go through the details here. It's more or less kind of obvious if you're familiar with a lot of this, uh, a lot of this stuff. Um, you have orbits. Okay, so what do I mean by an orbit, more or less? So again, I, I'll, I'll just kind of write down um, loose, uh, <coughs> rough, and ready rough and ready definitions, excuse me. So an orbit through a point x naught of my tautological control system G. <clears throat> okay, so this is going to be um, uh, C of T, okay, where C um, <clears throat> uh, from, okay, and so I want to, um, uh, so T here could possibly be negative, okay, so in other words, I, I, I want to start at zero, um, but I may be going forwards or I may be going backwards, and actually the notation I often use to reflect that is this, okay? So in other words, this thing is equal to that when t is positive and it's equal to that when t is negative, okay? <clears throat> so these are uh, trajectories. So these are, um, is a trajectory for the uh, piecewise constant um, at LA subfamily. Okay, and in this definition here, T um, is an arbitrary real number. Okay, so that's the normal definition of an orbit. You start at X naught and you follow, and so piecewise constant, what does that mean? <clears throat> That means that you know between zero and t, I'm following on you know some neighborhood of uh, whatever point I happen to be at at, the, at that time. Um, I'm following a constant vector field of my system. So this is like a concatenation of integral curves of uh, constant vector fields from these families uh, of vector fields defined by f. Okay. Um, and then you can also define. Um, um, I forget what notation I use. 
God who resides in Okay. And so it's the same as above, except T is fixed now. <clears throat> okay, so this is this is you know, the orbit, this is the fixed time orbit, and all of the standard theorems that you know about orbits. So these are um, uh, Seussman's theorem. So orbits, for example, will be um, for for smooth or analytic systems. Uh, orbits will be uh, smooth or analytic, uh, immersed submanifolds. In fact, they're a tiny bit more structured than just being immersed submanifolds. <clears throat> okay. Sorry, so, so, yeah. so uh, for a piecewise constant, uh, sub -family, sub -family, yeah. so basically uh, your index and family is R. Where R and R are basically R and for the vector fields? Um, your I. I don't know if, if I want to think about indexing families, but it, but um, what it means is that around every time and every state, okay, um, uh, the time varying vector field that you're considering is in on some neighborhood of that um, uh, a piecewise constant family vector field. So in other words, you take that little interval. So I have my time t, okay. So t prime may be bigger, right? But I know I have some little interval here, and my vector field is. is <coughs> <laughs> piece by the cross from a family of little sub intervals like this, but that's what I mean by that. I don't know how to translate that into indexing families, but yeah, okay. Um, and so you can describe also, excuse me, um, you can describe also um, tangent spaces of orbits, okay, so in the analytic case, for example. Um, <clears throat> The tangent spaces of the orbits are: you take um, the vector fields, um, the germs of vector fields from here. Okay, you take Lie brackets of those and then take their germs and then evaluate them under that evaluation map that I have over there. Um, um, and the span of all those things is the tangent space of the orbit. Okay, so all of that kind of stuff is uh, those natural kinds of control theor theoretic results. Um, they 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 apply uh, when you use these notions of uh, 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 atelier trajectories. Okay. All right, so that's all I was going to talk about today. What I will talk about next time, and it'll be the last lecture, and I, I, I'm assuming I'll be able to get through it. Um, I'll talk about linearization. And so what, what we'll do at the very end of the, the last lecture is we'll go back to revisit that elementary example that I talked about at the very beginning um, and see how that works out. Okay. <clears throat>